My name is Major Jim Terry. And make sure we're all on the same page. If I disagree with you, it's because you are wrong. <laughs> Any question there? So with that, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about all the flight profiles of the C-47. And if you guys go ride with us, or if you wind up taking the flight experience and flying the airplane, you're going to need all this information. So to start off with, I'm not going to... Starting the airplane is like playing the piano. It takes uh, two hands and three fingers on this side and two fingers on this side, and you've got to move from primers back down to, to mixtures and things like that. I'm not gonna, I will show you that in the airplane. I will start one engine. I'll let you start the other. So we'll warm it up. We'll uh, run through the uh, before taxi, taxi checks, taxi out. And we will be using runway four today. And so what we'll do is we'll taxi up here and we'll bring it into the wind. C-47 is a very basic airplane. And if you've ever flown an airplane before, there are fundamentals you need to follow. And this airplane is a very fundamental airplane. And one of the primary fundamentals is you do everything into the wind. It's on the The airplane is a tail dragger. It's got a huge tail back there. The wind affects it tremendously. It will blow you all over the place. We don't have much wind today. I don't think that'll be much of an issue. But you still have to be ready for it. It has ailerons that are 24 feet long. If you're not holding the O, and you get a prop blast from another airplane or a good wind, it will jerk it out of your hands and it will hurt you. So you can only do that once before you learn to hang on. So as we, the first thing we do is we bring it into the wind. And that is a scale drawing to C-47. I get paid extra to draw that. <laughs> and so the first thing we do is uh, we check temperatures. We bring it up 1,700 RPM. And once it's stabilized at 1,700, uh, we do a uh, recycled props. Does anybody know what that means? It means put the props to a, change the pitch on them. Change twice. the pitch on the props, exactly. And why do we do that? So you make sure you can break when you stop. Make sure what? Make sure when you stop you can break. Reverse the pitch. Sort of. Okay. When you cycle the props, the domes are, are these huge chrome things on front of the blades. They hold about a gallon of oil. The oil is cold, it doesn't circulate. So we have to put, by this point, the engines are warm and we need to put warm oil in the domes. So we, we, come, we accomplish two things. We cycle the props, which limbers them up, and we get warm them up. We get warm oil up inside the domes. So we get the old oil out, get the warm oil in. Do that twice. Then, and does everybody understand the feathering, what that means? The props can change pitch. This is a twin engine aircraft. It is designed that when, the, when you're flying, the props are in one pitch, taking a small bite of air. But if the engine fails, that prop at that pitch becomes a huge trash can lid that you're pushing through the air. It creates a tremendous amount of drag. The airplane won't fly. The airplane will just take you to the scene of the crash. But these props are capable of being feathered, so we can turn them flat to the wind, to the airstream, and the airplane will fly. So it's essential that we not only cycle them and, and get the warm oil in there, but we test to make sure that they will in fact feather, because your life may depend on it. So we cycle the props twice, and then we do a feather check. We have a, there's two systems on the airplane. There's the hydraulic system that is the engine driven oil pump, and that's run by the prop builder, controlled by the prop builder. And then there's an electrical pump. The electric pump, forces oil into the dome at a higher pressure, which forces the props to go into the feather position. So what we, and this, so what we do is we push, 
push a button, turns on the electric pump, we see a, a jump in, in, uh, uh, in, in amperage. We see an 80 amp jump in the amp meter. And we see the tachometer starting to come down because they're starting to go into failure. As soon as it does that, we pop the button back out and turn it off. We tested it, it works. We do that on both of them. Then we cycle the props again. Reason for that is to make sure the engine system is back in control. We went to the electrical system, now we want to go back to the engine system, make sure it's got it, because we need the, need the uh, governor to be in control during normal flight. So we cycle the props again. Then we do a mag check. Who can tell me about a mag check? What's a mag? It's where you turn one mag, mag off and the, leave the other on and then reverse. What does a mag do? It's what keeps the engine going, correct? It does. A magneto is nothing more than a spark generator. It, uh, it sends a pulse through each one of the wires at a specified time that fires the spark plug. There are two mags on each engine. It's a redundant system. If one mag fails, the engine will continue to run. We need to check to make sure both mags are running. So what we do is we, at a higher, higher engine setting, 1700 RPM, we go right both, which means we just check the right mag, we turn the left mag off. <coughs> I can't see the left engine from where I'm sitting on the right side, and you can't see the right engine. So when we're doing the mag check on the right engine, I'm looking at the engine and you're looking at the tachometer. So you're looking for a slight drop in the tachometer and I'm looking for a shake in the engine. So we go right both, engine runs smooth again, then we go left both, engine once again hopefully doesn't shake, RPM doesn't drop, engine runs smoothly, we go back to both. So we have now cycled the props. We know that the props are set for takeoff. We've checked the mags. We get back down to idle. We have to do this pretty quick. It's a radial engine. It doesn't have enough airflow flowing over it at this power setting to keep it cool. It will get hot, particularly on a hot summer day. So we can't dally. This whole thing has to happen pretty quickly. Okay, once we've gotten to this point, then we do the four takeoff checklist. Four takeoff checklist, nothing more than a checklist. Uh, we go through and make sure the airplane is configured correctly for takeoff, check the, uh, the prop settings, the mixtures are rich, the trim tabs are set, the flaps are up. All the important things that if you forgot one of them would bite you on the takeoff board. So we do four takeoff check and then we go below the line. Below the line is nothing more than a line on the checklist. Once we call the tower, the tower clears us up on the runway, we go below the line, which is your final configuration check. It's, uh, it's closing the cow flaps, it's locking the tail wheels, windows, hatches, landing lights, things of that nature. So now, we bring it up on the runway, bring it to a complete stop right on the center line. And from this point, we bring it up to 30 inches of manifold pressure. 30 inches, we live at the bottom of an ocean of air. And the air presses against our bodies pretty consistently at around 30 inches of mercury on the barometer. At, when we bring the engines up to 30 inches of manifold pressure, we are bringing the engines up to their highest power setting that you can attain before the superchargers kick in and start augmenting. If there's something wrong with the engine, we're going to see it at this power setting. Beyond that power setting, the superchargers start augmenting it, and it'll mask problems that you won't, you won't be able to see. So 30 inches of manifold pressure, what we want to see is we want to see 2100 RPM. We want to see the manifold pressure smashed at 30. We want to see the tax smashed at 21. We want to see oil pressures in the green, fuel pressures. This is our final check. If you can read the instrument panel at this point, it's not shaking so hard that you can't focus on it, the airplane's probably good to go. So this is the final, this is where we convince ourselves the airplane will fly. So we release the brakes at this point and the pilot now becomes a bus driver. He shifts his attention and his gaze 
from inside the cockpit, looking at all the instruments, to outside, and he doesn't look inside again. He shifts his focal point to the end of the runway. In this airplane, literally, the windshield is right there. You will bang the bill of your baseball cap on the windshield. From that point on, the nose curves away from you. The only frame of reference you have is a bolt sticking up right in front of you that holds the windshield wiper, which is literally six inches from your nose. You can't tell. You've got 53 feet of bus behind you. As you start your takeoff roll, the airplane can start deviating, and you don't even notice it because your frame of reference is screwed up. You're sitting in front of the fulcrum point, and the only way you can detect that the airplane is starting to deviate is by focusing on the end of the runway, and you'll, you'll see the deviations. You correct for that. So at this point, we're at 30 inch of manifold pressure, 2100 RPM. The right seater will throw his thumb up in front of the pilot. That means that he has done his scan. He's convinced the airplane will fly. If the pilot agrees with him, his heels go to the floor. Airplane starts to roll. He starts the throttles forward, and the right seater sets the throttles at 38 inches manifold pressure. And it comes up to 2,500 RPM. If you thought it was noisy here, and at this point there's noise levels to sterilize mice, we have no mice breeding in the airplane. At this point, you think the world is coming down on you. You cannot hear yourself think, literally. You cannot hear what's going on inside your head. So the pilot's focusing down here, the airplane's beginning to roll, the airplane's screaming, and at 40 knots, which is about the time it takes to get the throttles from 30 to 38 inches to bring the tail up. Bring the tail up is uh, like any other tail dragger. You push hard forward on the yoke. The airplane will not come up on its nose no matter what you do at this point because of all the power that the props are generating putting the prop last over the tail. So it cannot come up on its nose. So push forward, tail comes up, go back to the neutral position. The airplane will stall at 53 knots. What does it mean, airplane stall? What does that work? Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> it just means you exceed the angle of attack, or you just simply lose lift and you can't fly. You just fall out of the sky. It means the airplane can't fly. You're exactly right. The airplane quits flying. The airplane goes from being an airplane to a rock. So she comes down out of the sky like a box box rocks. This airplane weighs 26,000 pounds and stalls at 53 knots. We do not want this airplane flying at 53 knots. It's wallers, it's hanging on the props, it scares you. So, you bring the tail up, we hold it on the ground till 84. 84 is V1 and V2. V1 is rotate, and so Douglas has decided the safe time to fly this airplane is when it's at 84, basically 30 knots past stall speed. So, so at 84, all we have to do is relax the back pressure. We're holding forward a little bit of forward pressure on the yoke to keep the airplane from flying. All we do is relax that, and the airplane goes up like an elevator. It wants to fly. It wanted to fly at 53. Now it's, it's, it, you, it, it goes up. So as you're going up, the right seater immediately starts bringing the throttles back. So we're at 38, we're at takeoff power. He brings it back to 30, 20. 30 inch manifold pressure, 2000 RPM. As the airplane begins its climb, it will go past 94 almost immediately. 94 is safe single engine speed. If you've ever flown a twin or seen a twin, the airspeed indicator has this blue line on it. That blue line was developed to tell the pilot, if you don't go below that blue line, the airplane will fly on a single engine. This airplane was invented before, uh, and was flying before they invented the blue line. So we don't have a blue line. The airplane was never certified with a blue line. They didn't know what that was. A whole lot of folks got killed 
not knowing what a blue line was. So we have what they call a safe single engine speed, means at 94, this airplane will fly on a single engine. If the gear's up, flaps are up, feathered, it will fly. And it flies very nicely. So we lift off at 84, we start power reduction, we pass 94 almost immediately. And then we're looking for 110. At 110, we're getting enough airflow over the engines that uh, at that high power setting, they're happy. So we keep climbing up at, uh, at 30, 20, 110 knots, and we'll go up to 1,000 AGO. We will likely do a left turnout. So as soon as we pass 500 feet, which is off the end of the runway, as soon as we have positive climb, we'll get the gear up, <coughs> flaps are already up, we'll climb at 110, at 500 feet, we'll do after takeoff checklist. So we'll get the boost pumps off, uh, we'll get the cow flaps reset, and we'll check the engine, make sure we didn't blow a gasket, we don't have oil going everywhere, we'll check to make sure the gear, in fact, did come up at 500 feet. So at that point, we're happy that the airplane's flying. If you're gonna lose an engine, in a radial, 99% of the time, you're gonna lose it at first power reduction. So when we set power at 38, as soon as we reduce it to uh, 30 units of manifold pressure, if you're gonna fail an engine, that's about where it's gonna go. So at this point, at 500 feet, we check our engine instruments to make sure they're not going, that the oil pressure isn't going down, the oil temperature isn't going up. So we feel pretty safe at 500 feet. At this point, we could turn around and get back to the runway if we had to, so we'll go ahead and start a left turn. Start our crosswind, then we turn downwind, we climb to 1,400 feet. What's the significance of 1,400 feet? Sure, I hear, I hear crickets. Legal. Legal? This airfield is roughly 425 feet above sea level. Our altimeters are set to fly, you know, you know, at sea level. Zero in the altimeter would be sea level. So at 1,400 feet, we're 1,000 feet above the ground. And so that's pattern altitude. So we, we continue downwind, 1,400 feet. As soon as we get to that point, I'm gonna bring it back to 25 inches, manifold pressure, 1,800 RPM. Start to let the engines cool down. By the time we get to midfield, I'm going to have it down to 22 inches of manifold pressure and 1,800 RPM. <coughs> if you're good, you can maintain that all the way through. You never have to change power settings again until you're rolling it on the runway. Radial engines don't like people moping with the throttles. It changes temperatures. There's 160 alloys inside that engine. When it's running at whatever power setting you've got it at, all those alloys are at temperature and everything fits and everything is at the clearances and tolerances that the engineers designed it to be and the engine's happy. When you reduce power, you're, let, you, you're taking the fuel off, which lets it slow down, which let, you've still got that high amount of air flowing through it and it cools it. If you do it fast enough, it's called shock cooling. Lots of things break when they start <coughs> shock cooling, things start to crack. So we do everything slow. We don't change power settings unless we just absolutely have to. Radials don't like it. We get opposite the touchdown point. We go gear down, lapse a quarter before land check. So we check that point that, that the gear is in fact down. We have a green light. We got the flap set at a quarter. We got boost pumps on. We got mixtures rich and clearance to land, we get the landing lights on. You continue downwind, this is very fundamental. Any airplane you fly, <coughs> this is exactly the way you fly it. We get downwind at 45 degrees off the end of the runway. So when you see the runway passing off at your 45 degrees, that's when you turn inbound. So a 90 degree turn in, flaps to half, same power setting. Turn final, flaps to full, and final check. So, gear down, flaps full, mixture's rich, I got a green light, you're cleared to land, I got your props in the flare, and pilot has his hands down on the throttles. Come over to the approach lights, 
at never less than 80 and somewhere around 94. So between 94 uh, knots and 80 knots is where you want to be as you come over the approach lights. That gives you, we stall at 53, wherever that number went. So it, it, and we know that safe single engine is 94 and got the nose down. So if we, if we lost the engine at that point, we just go ahead and land. But if we had to do a go around, truck comes out on the runway, you've got enough speed, you're already flying, just bring the power up and she'll just fly away. So we come down the runway, we roll it on the runway. As soon as it's rolling, you plant it, bring the tail up a little bit so it won't bounce, bring the power back and let it roll out. Brakes for this airplane today are non-existent. There are certain parts on there that uh, we can't get. So we don't use the brakes. No one has ever called me a queer if not making the first turn off. So I let it roll all the way to the end, let the tail settle all by itself, turn off the runway, taxi back, keeping it rolling the whole time. Passengers like it, it's nice and smooth, acts like we know what we're doing. Life is good. Then we, uh, we taxi back. If, if you're doing a flight experience and you want to fly this airplane, even if you've never been in an airplane before, I will let you come down this final after you haven't done all this. We'll rub the wheels on the runway one time. We'll go back around, we'll do this whole thing again, and I'll let you land it to a full stop. And it is a life's changing experience. <laughs> I have people come out of there that's like, oh my God. And it is amazing. So once we taxi off, we'll taxi back, and then we'll do the shutdown. Questions? Everybody got them. At what point do the superchargers come into play? All the way through this? Superchargers, anything above 30 inches of manifold pressure. This particular airplane has these super hot rod engines on it, which we'll put on in the 50s. These engines, the original engines that came out were 1,125 horsepower. These engines are 1,425 horsepower. This airplane was built before World War II started. It was on the assembly line when Pearl Harbor happened and then the Army took it away from the airlines. This airplane is a C-49J versus a C-47. This airplane weighs 3,900 pounds less than a C-47 because it's structured differently. It's not structured for cargo, it's structured to be a transport. As a result, uh, the C-47 also had 1,100 horsepower. We put 1,425 horsepower on each, um, each wing. We totally stripped it out. The airplane is 4,000 pounds, two tons lighter than a stock C-47. So the airplane flies like a rocket. And then they put these hot rod engines on there that developed this 1,425 horsepower. And we can go up to 46 inches of manifold pressure if we wanted to. But we actually only take off at 38 when we're heavy and 34 when we're light. If we went to 46 inches, it would go up like an elevator. It's not any faster. It's still a Douglas, but but it will climb like crazy. Maybe it'll tolerate uh, 46 inches uh, boost, essentially, as we call it now, boost. Yes. It'll tolerate that at any point? It's designed for it. Yep. Yeah. That is take off power. That's called METO, maximum something, takeoff power, whatever, maximum extended takeoff power. Anybody? All right, well, if you want, we can take a short break and then I'm gonna take you out to the airplane and we're gonna do a walk around. We'll make sure that we're gonna do our first attempt to convince ourselves the 74-year-old airplane will fly. <laughs> Okay. Good PLF parachute landing fall over here to my right. I'm going to hit my five points of contact, my feet, uh, my, my calf, knees, uh, butt, and then lat muscle. And I'm going to turn my body as I do it to displace that weight so I don't injure myself. So looking up at the horizon, I'm slip to the right, I'm going forward. So we've hit the ground at this point, we'll roll over to our back as the chute inflates. We're going to pull our risers and detach, detach ourselves. After we've done this, this here, this left attachment from my left riser is going to come off, allowing me to slip out of the harness. 
Once I've slipped out of the harness, at that point, I'm going to take my risers, I'm going to deflate my parachute, and I'm going to start bringing in my risers. I'll have my bag, my parachute off my back at that point, and I'll have it open. And I'm just, at that point, I'm stuffing my risers. And I'm stuffing the parachute back into my back into my uh, my, my parachute harness. Um, once I've done that, I'm going to roll it up. I'm going to flip it over to my my front. I've taken my uh, my weapon, my sidearm, whether that be the uh, M1 carbine, uh, M1 Garand, and I've thrown it over my front. I'm ready to run to the patrol base. Uh, or the rally point to meet up with the rest of my platoon or the rest of my company so we can uh, set up and, uh, and proceed with our next mission, whether that be an ambush, uh, a raid, um, a uh, movement to contact, uh, just depending on what that, what that uh, operation calls for. Um, so really being an uh, airborne soldier is no different than being a regular uh, leg infantryman. The only difference is, is you jump into, uh, into the combat zone versus uh, being trucked in or, or walking in. But the missions are exactly the same, uh, whether they're uh, an offense or a defensive operation. Um, they're, they're all the same for every uh, you know, American infantryman. And luckily, that was a pretty that was pretty accurate uh, PLF. It was good. Okay. When, when, when you have all this stuff on, nine times out of ten, you're going to end up falling uh, pretty much feet, uh, feet, uh, butt, uh, back of the head, or feet head. Um, it's never going to be quite as it is in the uh, schoolhouse when you have all the stuff off of you. Oh, I add to you, you don't hop like you did. He did that to give himself per propellant, okay? You, you come down flat, you do the PO immediately. You're not going to be able to help. <laughs> some, some, I've seen some little guys, very lightweight guys, in a good thermal, try to stand up because it's cool if you can stand up on a landing, okay? Most of the time they get hurt trying to do that. <laughs> You know, because you want that, that five points of contact and those feet together is so important. You've got a lot more, you've got a lot more strength in two feet and legs than you do one, and that's the reason for that. Okay. Any questions on what we covered so far? Yes, sir. Um, right here's detachment for the risers. You said right? Yes. So, and when you yeah. detach that, that detaches the entire parachute. Yeah, Just one side. He can do both. Okay. He can do both and detach it, yeah. but if you do, well, if, if you, you detach both of those, yeah, yeah, the yeah, shoot, yeah. if it was yeah, inflated well, behind you in the wind, would a couple of pull away. away. If, if you were land on the ground, ground wind is strong enough, that parachute is going to say inflate. So by pulling one one of the uh, releases, it releases the air to and, and the parachute deflates. Okay, so you don't really have to get rid of both of them. You can only get rid of one of them. And that so, was still about the south of ground if, if this was the, uh, the quick detach was, was such a uh, advancement, why would you leave the, the backup chute on if once you were real close to the ground? Because you really can't get to it right now, right? Yeah, but you don't need to. Right. Okay. This would, yeah, this would actually come out. You'd unhook the uh, reserve chute as well uh, while you're on the ground, and you pop that off, and then you hit the... Uh, the uh, detach detachment that we hit earlier. So just took all that stuff away. Right? You do, but that would still be for more of a water <laughs> to, 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 to get out of the chute, get out of the harness faster, and get away from all the equipment, so you don't have that drag to pull you down. I didn't hear, hear him drop the bag, his bag with all his ammunition things. When were you supposed to drop that? Typically, about like Larry said, about 50 feet off the deck, 50 to. Um, you know, a couple hundred feet off the deck uh, was when you would when you would drop that, um, and then that rope would would swing down. Typically, that'd be around maybe 20 feet, 15, 20 feet down, and that bag or that that rifle would catch uh, on your leg. And then whenever you would land, you know, typically you'd land a little bit left or right of that bag. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're just you're just getting down as quickly as you can, um, and that's that's the uh, the mo for all the uh, the dash ten parachutes uh, is to get get the soldier get the airborne down as safely as possible in the quickest amount of time. So typically around uh, 200 feet down to 50 feet is when you would deploy that. Personal preference, but I've never seen anybody land on the bag because of, because of the fact that you've always got ground wind, and ground wind's going to pull you some direction. Uh, away from that bag because it's going to be stationary when it hits. It's heavy enough; it's not going anywhere. And it's and you're going to be um, if you're being drugged because the ground wind is strong enough to keep that parachute inflated. 
that bag's going to be dragging with you. It's not an anchor. <laughs> Anybody want to do a PLF? <laughs> Right. Gentlemen, we can turn that some of our gear while, you're keep, while you keep Mercy talking. Don't let us interrupt you. Can we go through that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm just kind of. Yeah, so we'll get it on. There's two schools of thought on the on reserve parachute, depending on how far up you are on the air. One is you can release the parachute completely, the main parachute completely, by pulling both of these down, and you'll, you will start to fall rapidly. But the main parachute will be gone. Okay? To, and uh, when you pull this handle, on this style parachute, you've got to feed it out. Okay, it, won't, it does not automatically deploy. You're going to break the strings. This is going to come down. This is going to unsnap. This is going to break. This is a little clip here. All that's going to break away, open up the bag when that handle's pulled, but you still have to feed that parachute out until it gets a little bit of wind. Once it reaches, you've got to start grabbing some wind, you can play it on its own. Remember, you're jumping in a combat jump. Jump today, the Army Ranger jump from about 800 feet. There's no need for this stuff because they don't have time to deploy. Okay, some of them, some guys don't even take it with them because they know at 800 feet, my main doesn't work. I'm dead because there's not enough time to break away or even get even over this reserve in that time. And most of the time, it's night anyway. Most jumps today are in nighttime, not daytime. So, which is a different concept altogether, because you know, regardless of how dark it is, you still can see a little bit of the outside of the horizon. But those landings are probably more easy. They're easier to land in the nighttime than they are in the daytime, because you're not conscious. You're not looking for that ground. Yeah. Your your tiptoes are feeling it. Okay, because that's your first point of contact is your toes, and because uh, you can't really can't see the ground. And in a combat situation like the Rangers jumped into uh, Panama in the, uh, the air zone down there, the airfield down there to take that one down, there was a lot of fire coming up. And when they jumped into Grenada, Grenada, same thing. A lot of fire coming up at them. Uh, so it's, your, your pucker factor is pretty tight in the whole oh, scenario oh, until you get on the ground, get, on, yeah, get unasked, and get your weapon in your hand, and then you're starting to feel a little more secure. It's really, it's really about getting to the ground as quickly as possible. Yes. And, and a normal, a normal jump uh, for safety uh, purposes is 1,200 feet, but a combat jump is anywhere, like Larry said, down to around 800 feet. Um, in the past, it's been less than that. It's, it's truly, you know, the amount of time to deploy your reserve shoots pretty normal, pretty normal. Um, I've talked to people who've done it before, who've deployed both, you know, the reserve chute, you know, some, some uh, 82nd Airborne units are just, hey, if you have the slightest bit of difficulty or, or issue, go ahead and deploy it and, you know, ride two parachutes down. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just kind of SOP, standard operating procedure. Um, I've only seen one, one major issue on, a, on an airborne jump, uh, almost uh, an entanglement between two uh, soldiers, one was on top of the other, like Larry said, and that, uh, that top parachute, uh, the, the wind, the air, uh, wasn't able to inflate the chute, so the kid started to drop, um, and, and luckily he was able to slip, pull his risers to the right, and had enough wind underneath him to slip over to the right-hand side of this uh, airborne soldier below him. Yeah. And by the time the chute inflated, they were about almost facing each other. And at that point, your, your biggest fear from the schoolhouse onward is an entanglement with another soldier and another soldier's riders. It's not impossible to land together. It's not. It's not. And they tell you, honestly, they, they train you to do that to land together. So you're going to come down a little bit higher rate of speed, but, but not enough to really injure you. In jump school, the concept on the reserve is when it's out, whip it out. Okay. Those very words. All right. Any other questions? Thank you for your attendance. We are now a qualified airborne student. I mean, uh, jumper. Uh, we will pin the wings on you shortly. Right now, I'm putting on the parachute. Yeah. They jump with. Uh, the guys in World War II jump with double their body weight, about 180 extra pounds usually. Yeah. Um, I have most of my stuff on, minus uh, 
a few yeah, small like, like, like a, another ammo bag, uh, demolition. Ten years. Yeah. And you got uh, two guns there, and you got a rifle and a uh, canteen. You have a rifle strapped to you. Yeah. Uh, this is your sidearm here. Yeah. This is just. You a, got a hatchet there. Oh, that's a shovel. Shovel. Yeah. And those are typical jump shoes, right? Yeah, those, these are the jump boots that they wore. They, they, and this is all World War II outfit, too, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. How many times you jumped? Oh, I haven't jumped. I'm only yeah. 16. Oh, okay. okay. You know the stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's your sidearm? Yeah. Huh? Oh. I never, I've never gone there. Let me see. Get over here. Get over here. And this is all. That machete ain't going to stab you. Get over here so the sun doesn't get me. Okay. Okay, now you got. It's his World War II stuff. Is that what it looked like to World War II? He's got everything. Mm -hmm. somebody's, he's this got everything. Except his front suit. This is typical right before you put the Before jump. he puts the jumpsuit on. All that junk's on. Point to each one and tell me what all the thing is. Tell me what this Right here is a uh, 1911 pouch. It's where you keep your holsters. Okay. Ammo. 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 Okay. Ammo. And what's in that other? Uh, right here is just a uh, Rangers pouch. You could put anything from extra ammo to grenades in here. Okay. And then what's this thing? Machete and what's else yeah, in it? That's machete and uh, this is a, a musette bag. A what? Uh, it's called a musette bag and what you would do is you would just you would put your range you would put a rain jacket in here you would put two pairs of socks your shaving supplies and you know, your K rations okay and then what's in this bag here okay that's your rifle that's a rifle that's an M, M what is it this is a M1 Garand yeah. And that's going down with you. And yeah. you're, that's why you have to land on the other side or you'll break it or break break your bones. Yeah. That's why you always try to go the other, opposite uh, of that. Usually they would, uh, 700, they would have their harness and then usually they would stick it right here. Yeah. Speak it up, speak up, speak up. Uh, usually they would uh, keep it right in here. Yes. And so, because the impact of the jump, a lot of stuff would fly off. Many people, their, you know, their helmets would fly off, their weapons. Yeah. So, you really, you really had to try really hard to keep, keep it there. Hard. They keep it there, but your your other your parachute's right there, that spare one, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's how you kept the rifle tucked in. I see. The spare. And then this is the uh, M1 Garand. That's M1. Yep. Yeah. It, that's the most common. That's a 30 caliber bullet, right? 30 out six. 30 out. Yep. 30 out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that one or how many clip? How many goals in the clip there? Uh, eight. Eight, eight in the clip. So what kind of bullet? Thirty out six. Okay, that's a common rifle World War Two. Oh yeah, this is one of the most common, along with the uh, 1903. Uh -huh. They use the 1903 more in the Pacific. This was more of a European rifle. Gentlemen, real quick, those people that are going on the C47. Okay, I'm gonna look at the back of him. He's got pliers right there. Yeah. Uh, Pliers. See, we are a part of the 326 engineers, and en engineers they kept pliers and other types of tools because they had to dig entrenchments and cut wire and uh -huh. various tasks like that. And you got a rank there? What's your rank there? Uh, that is a, a tech corporal. Tech corporal. And tech means that you specialize in a skill that the regulars cannot perform. Yeah. And this one over here, yeah, they got it. What's that? What's that? That is the uh, patch of the 101st Airborne. They came out of uh, Camp Fort Campbell, yep. a lot of them, yeah, 101 first everyone. They eat nails. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for telling me this. What's your name? Uh, Andrew Johnson. Okay, Andrew, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Well, on the other side of Andrew, we've got, we've got a shovel and a canteen. These guys had double your weight with all this stuff. By the time you went down, it was double your weight. Yeah, and uh, a very, a very sad factor of airborne was the Germans during Normandy they would flood the fields, and you were weighed down so much that a lot of them drowned. You had the three. Uh, Say it again. You had the three release as well. You have this release, this release under here, and one under here. Yeah. And a lot of them couldn't get out. They couldn't get out in the so water or in the... When in they landed in the water, they had this canopy over them, and then they had this to struggle with. And they couldn't release it. Now we got faster release. And this is your life vest, but it was under everything. It was under and you and a lot of them drowned in Normandy, is what you're saying. Yep. When they landed in the water. Huh. Even with that flotation, it wouldn't hold them up. Oh, no. Not enough. It's double your weight. Double. Yeah, yeah double. It was in the wrong place. If they would have been able to release this, if they would be able to release that, they would have been all right. If you wouldn't have had this here, yes. then it would have been out more. Yeah, you would have been a lot better off. Huh. But a lot of guys drowned doing that. Yeah. Okay.
Thanks. And those boots, are those special boots or what are they? Those were issued to airborne troops. Do they take the the, the tough landing easier than others? They said they did. But, yeah. You got them all shined up. Those are shined up. Yeah. But, yeah. And in this bag again is what? Um, I keep, they kept, they usually kept their rain ponchos in there. And as, food? And, yeah, they kept K rations, which was a box. Yeah. And it had various, it had canned meat, cigarettes, matches, you know, all the things that they needed. They yeah. needed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Steve. Where's Steve? Right here. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, all aboard. All right, here we go. Casey, come back here. Yeah, we have to make sure that's all clear. This is a uh, A or a C-47 plane. A lot of paratroopers jumped out of this plane in World War II. Uh, remember paratroopers, close to 50,000 of them at D-Day in World War II. Uh, that's a pilot there. Uh, this plane weighed close to 27,000 pounds. 1,300 horsepower engine there and 1,300 on the other side. Uh, it's been spiked up to, to uh, 1,400 horsepower uh, since it's been revised since World War II. Little holes in the window are for, um, for guns to help protect themselves. Now these a little bit for photography. Uh, uh, excellent plane, very uh, soft landing, soft uh, takeoff. Huh? Taylor made craft, World War II Jeep. This is the Freedom Heritage um, hangar. Be a party here tonight. the C-47 it's got the paratroopers on board they're going out for a demonstration and those are the um, the white stripes on the back of the plane are the uh, designees that it's an American plane that was painted on the, uh, Normandy at D-Day those identified Americans versus other types of planes nobody knew what was going to go on until the moment it was done other two planes here these are t6 trainers they're world war ii trainers after a person uh, trained on a stearman then they graduate up to one of these planes these are identical nearly identical uh, planes but if you look it was two areas for two pilots one behind one ahead so it was a trainer pilot and then they jumped into the p-47 after this plane so this is a pretty advanced plane uh, taught them a lot of things they needed to know about flying before they ended up flying and there you see the taxing of the c-47 c-47 a lot bigger plane than even the the uh, p-47 we had one of the uh, veterans of world war ii here with us uh, today and he his name is mr brinker and he was on a c-46 the c-46 was similar to that plane but the engines were um double in size uh, those are 1300 horsepower each engine and uh, the uh, 
P47 is a horsepower of close to 2800. So they had two 2800 engines, lots of power in a C46, and that's what flew over the hump in World War II uh, to get supplies to to China because it couldn't get supplies to China. It had to go from India over the Himalayas into China. It's called flying over the hump, and we had a veteran here that had done that in a plane similar to this one. This is June um, 26, 2015, and you see in the what we're trying to photograph there is the uh, Blue Angels. That's the mothership of the Blue Angels. There's all the Blue Angels. They're doing an air show here in Evansville, Indiana, and uh, we just saw the C-47 pass. There's a couple other planes that just flew around Dress Plaza just a minute ago, and there's all the Blue Angels planes, and there's their mothership in the back. Uh, Gonna have lots of different air show this weekend.